Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And I'd like to ask you, do you get things done? Are you good at finishing things? Do you actually get become successful? Or do things get in your way? And what could get in your way? And to help us learn more about how things get in our way is our guest, who is the author of a wonderful book. I love this book. It's called The Final Eighth. Enlist your inner selves to accomplish your goals. And so that's what we want to do is accomplish our goals. So let's get help from Bridget Dangle Gaspard. Bridget, welcome to Energy Stew. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here, Peter. Well, I'm so glad that we could talk because I, I got so much out of your book because it really helped me know myself better and that's what it's for yeah i'm thrilled to hear that it is <laughs> to know all of yourself so to speak <laughs> all your many selves yes exactly because we have these inner selves that are pretty dominant they all have different roles and you give them different names and yes. i love to see how you identify them so that i can do that in analyzing what gets in my way. So I say, okay, it's this part of me or that part of me that is troublesome. Yes. And there's also parts of me that are heroes too. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So the way I work at the tool itself is called voice dialogue. And it's a revolutionary method that I learned from my mentors who I trained with, the doctors Hal and Sidra Stone. And the idea is that we are composed of many selves that is a healthy personality and that all of our selves have a noble purpose, which is protection. So even if they're troublesome, so to speak, and they really are troublesome, their motivation is pure. Somehow from their point of view, they're protecting you. And so in voice dialogue, and my book takes you through this, you go and you can ask yourself any number of questions as the self. So you can journal as a self, say a perfectionist or a fearful one or a hero. And each self has a gift and a sting. And that's why it's the final eighth. It's like you're seven eighths of the way there. And I was working with all these clients. It was a mystery. Like what was going on? Literally, I knew they were hardworking, creative, talented people. And there, the finish line was right there. And I'm like, let's go. And they just couldn't. And we're devastated. And that's when it came out. This is like an issue. And it came out whole as a final eight. And what's happening is that you think you want your goal with every fiber of your being. But the truth is there are some parts of you that are against it. And for very good reason. And so in my book. You well, they think it's a very good reason. Correct. From their point of view, they they think it's a very good reason, exactly. But they're so strong in their reasoning, they're the ones that are stopping you. So I like to say they have the power, their troublesomeness is making you stop because you can't go forward, whether it's your procrastination takes over or your overwhelmed self takes over, whatever it is, and they're winning if you look at it that way, because you're not, you're, you see the goal, it's right in front of you, you've worked hard and you can't cross it and it's a mystery. So these are parts of us that are afraid for us. Correct. And they think they're protecting us from what they're afraid that we'll self-destruct. So they're, they're gonna get ahead of us on it. And, Correct. Yeah. Now, sometimes they are actually right in that they're gonna bring up an, a, an issue you need to take care of. Like right. for example, I had a client who was a performer and she was doing really well and she got in the union and her parts were getting bigger in, the, in those days, pre-COVID, there were actual theaters and she was moving up in the, the ranks of the theaters. And then she started self-sabotaging. And so we went to her resistant self. And I, I was expecting kind of this big, thick energy, like a toddler, no. But instead, this self kind of came in close like this and whispered, if my client gets more successful, she's going to be an alcoholic. And then she started weeping. And I was stunned. I'd worked with her for a year. It never had come up that it was a problem. And it turned out she was going to become an alcoholic if she didn't deal with learning how to make boundaries. 
Because as you know, performers, it's required, it's social, that you do networking. And so our whole focus changed. And then it's like the final eighth problem evaporated. So it wasn't about working harder. It's rarely about working harder. It was literally about dealing with this weakness, which was she said yes when she meant no. She didn't plan ahead, so she got her rest. So then she might take drink too much boat because it loosened her up for all, in a way, the right reasons. But that part was correct. Right. And that's what's so wild. But then that part, once the the it was dealt with, the part couldn't care less about acting. Go ahead, perform away, be a Broadway star. As but that from that part point of view, it's like, but be a Broadway star or be an alcoholic. There's no contest. You're but, not going to be a Broadway star. The make, end. Make sure you're not too big for your britches. <laughs> exactly. That's a big one. How many of us have grown up in that type of household where apparently big britches were a bad thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've always had this desire to have a bigger footprint in life. Mm. to you know because i do believe in myself and think that i should be more uh out there doing bigger things but every time i try things get in the way there's sabotage there's betrayals all kinds of stuff and i think that actually it's the it, there's something at work that fears for me Maybe I had a past lifetime where I was much bigger and got mm. into trouble for it. And so there's a part of me that says, no, we, we, we can't let you get that big because uh, you'll, you'll be in trouble again. You know, too vulnerable, too exposed, right. too many people will become problematic to you if you're that big. So let's keep you more moderate. So with the final eighth process, we would honor that, that, and perhaps it's all true, like that, that there was this ancestral message and it wasn't safe and this part of you holds that. And then when you're back in center, you, Peter, who has access now to more of yourself, having learned that, or whoever the client is, but we're talking about you right now. <laughs> but then the other part of it you can say, but you know what? I do want to try to make it even more in this lifetime. And you're, you have pretty big footprints. So just saying, it doesn't even matter what size success you are. This issue could be at any level of success. So right. then you take this part and you hold it dear and you love it and you cultivate other parts and you don't ask that fearful part to be at the negotiating table. And you don't ask that part to not be afraid. You let that part know, thank you. I'm going to be aware I have this potential karma. And so maybe there will be betrayal. It's not like I hope betrayal never happens. It's like, I'll be, let me get stronger about it. Let me be wiser about and it. Trust me. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Trust my wisdom. And again, if you start to take care of the concerns, like, all right, yeah, I better not get too naive. Let me make sure that I have my naivete in check then I'm safer for myself and everyone else as I move across this finish line. Right. And I don't have to erase this part of me that holds one of my stories. Okay. But it's not the whole story and it never was and never will be if you get conscious to it and dial down the volume of the story. Right. And that's why it's so important to, to be able to hear from all of your parts. Yes. The, 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 the ones that, you know, might be troublesome, but also those that are uh, really supportive and wise. Exactly. And with the voice dialogue, the final eighth way we look at it, we we would go to your troublesome self and we and that self would speak from the eye and we would really ask. It's not about, hey, troublesome self, could you be a little less troubling? No. You'd say, hey, so tell me what you'd like me to know. And, and there's a whole bunch of questions in the book. You could ask like, what are your early memories? What, what do you think about the goal, the final eighth goal? And then again, you can assess this when you go back to center, what actions you wanna take. But that troublesome part, again, has wisdom. Now, it could be that it's off and wrong. And so then you upgrade it. You say, yeah, that was true. That's how we grew up, but that's not the house we live in anymore. Sometimes you're right, the self <laughs> is technically wrong. But then you update it. 
and again, bring it into your fold, your current right. inner fold. Right. You say, look at me now. How can you say that? <laughs> right. And, and then often that self will go, oh, yeah, that's true. Okay. I'll be troublesome about something else, but I'm good now. I got it. Oh, I love and that. Actually, you, one of the chapters is about upgrading yourselves. Like sometimes selves today, their role is too minor. And so they're like, you know, I'm one of your superheroes and you're asking me to balance your checkbook. That's ridiculous. So sometimes the trouble is you're not giving parts of yourself a noble, large enough purpose that the actual self-sabotage is you're thinking too little or you're, you're behaving too little. So it's really liberating when you find out. And it's like, oh my gosh, I was asking you to be the maid when you're actually the um, mogul. Right. Wow. Now, th this is so wonderful. And what's so important is to learn that we can communicate within ourselves to each of these parts and mm. and to learn how to identify them. And you have exercises in here about how to find out what they call themselves and what their purpose is and uh, how they think they're, you know, they're helping us. And and it's fascinating. I, I was I got so excited when I realized yes I'm going to start talking to myself better because this gives you more of a structure to do that with it right yes it's like a completely an entree into that and now brain science is absolutely showing that we think as a multiplicity of selves so when they've done different uh, brain imaging research where you think about yourself in a particular way and then how you think about yourself like your decision maker different parts of your brain light up. And they're also showing that when you use the third person versus the first person, different parts of your brain show up. And when you use the third person, like, oh, my perfectionist took over and made me late on my deadline, say, that third person lights up more in the up here where you're in your decision-making aspects of your brain. And the I, like if I like as the perfectionist is much closer to the amygdala, which is more emotional. So they're showing that this natural way of that we behave is can be mapped in the brain. And so I we, have to, the, we have to get the ego out of the way, right? Right. And you could even say with voice dialogue, we'd say, let's talk to the ego, the part like, so you're the ego. Tell me about yourself. When you, when you say you're the ego, what does that mean? And then I would say you right size it because someone without an ego won't have any confidence to say, wait a minute here. I know a thing or two. So we don't want to get rid of our ego. We want to right size our ego. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. But also there's another thing that, that is going on or, or these, and we talked about these ancestral programs and, um, all of our conditioning in life yeah. and how actually that formed all these selves from the conditioning that they were experiencing as we were growing up and took on these roles to either protect us against future conditioning or, um, but in many ways it could lock us in and so we can't break the patterns. Exactly. And that's actually why I think the pain of being stuck is really a call to get conscious to break these patterns. Like it's actually a sign of success. You're trying to get ahead and then suddenly you're in a painful state of stuckness. Well, if you listen to it, then you do exactly what you just said. You're like, oh, you know, I've learned this about that self. I can, I can shift. I can cultivate different parts and I'm so much more and I'm not stuck. And, but the stuckness was the call that motivated you to find these different selves and what's going on. And like, wait a minute, I don't want to live out this. And I want to break the ancestral pattern. But we probably should also look around us at the current conditioning we live with and how we might have even created circumstances in our lives that reinforce negative conditioning. 100% agree. Absolutely. And that, yes because we're unconscious. So the cells that were reinforced as we were growing up are usually just the cells we live by. And it's who we think of as I am. We don't even think I'm these cells. We just think, well, that's how I am. As if I'm this one monolith that was given to me, reinforced by my upbringing. 
if I was limited to my monolith from my upbringing, I would not have a very interesting life, I'll just say. Right, but we do have survival mechanisms in us that think that we can't be any different because we survived our childhood, our, you know, our development. And if we now, if we change it, we might not survive. Right. And that's the voice dialogue is that we always want those cells. We call those the primary cells. And if, it, if in doubt, those cells are going to be right there helping to us survive. And I think that's why I love this method is it's so safe. We want those. Again, we just don't want them to be our only tools. I had a client once say, oh, I see. I used to have Neanderthal weapons and now I have Rolls Royce weapons, you know? <laughs> but if you need to batter something like a four-year-old, you're still gonna have that self that comes in and just says, sorry, I'm taking over. I'm truly worried about survival. We're hunkering down or whatever it is. We never lose those. And I think that's very, um, it's very, it helps people relax into feeling safe to move forward, knowing that if they need their go-to mechanisms of control, they're going to be there. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's fascinating how there are so many forces at work. And, and you might listen to the people around you and see how they're reinforcing some of, you know, both the positive and the negative and um, thinking that maybe that they're being helpful too. <laughs> it's, you, you're so right. I have this whole chapter called Practicing Safe Success because one of the really sad things is very often when people grow, they do have to say goodbye to some of their circle. I had a client who realized, she's like, wow, I had this friend who would meet for coffee and kvetching anytime. But then when she shifted and, and had started to build a life she loved, that friend was not willing to meet for Java and Joy. And so ultimately she tried to get her to like move with her and she had to leave the friendship because the friend was only going to allow that it never works out selves that she wanted to bond with. And this woman had broken through those. And it's like, that's, yes, things are going to work out. Yeah. But you have to be able to tolerate the distress that your environment's naturally going to change when you change yourselves. And some of it's going to be having to let go and it's going to be painful. I remember about 50 years ago, I was in a, um, a, a group, a therapy group, um, because I was married at the time to a different person I'm married to now. And, and she wanted me to do that. And um, so I cooperated and the therapist, I, I didn't like the therapist because I felt that everybody in the group were just feeling sorry for each other and not really, there were no recommendations for change. It was everybody just was agreeing how sad everything was for each person. Yeah, that's too one-sided. I agree. That's not, it's like, that's validating and it's important, the validation part. Like, yes, these sad things happen. But what else, now where do we go from here? And if there's no, now where do we go from here? Which I think is naturally developmental stages. It's Maslow's hierarchy. It's not even superimposed. It's part of our development as humans. Once we get to one stage, we want to get to the next. And, and yeah, I agree with you. It was missing the, let's, what's the next stage? I think a lot happy. of, there are a lot of therapists, I think that their fault is that they don't want to lose their, their clients and they don't help them grow enough. <laughs> well, I, um, I, I wish I didn't agree with you, but I know I, I, it's, it's not good. It's not helpful. It, and, I, and there is that motivation to keep people small for their own good. Right. And we might have other people in our life that we can call them vampires. Ooh, people who yes. get into our lives and just like to suck on our energy. Mm. And it's very hard to get them out because they figured out how to limit you and how to um, override your positive thoughts with their constant negative, you know, because there's such yeah. energy, they need to do that to you. And it's contagious. So like if we were gonna do some voice dialogue about that, like uh, then we would go to the part that is in connection with the vampire. And that's probably a part who's some type of pleaser or people pleaser. And we find more about what that part needs. So because that part is getting significance 
from the vampire needing them, even though the whole life is getting smaller because the vampire is sucking so much from that part's point of view, it's like, yeah, but I'm needed. And so once you understand what that part needs and wants and values, then you can, this could be an upgrade. I need you and I need you to protect my time because we've got this great goal. And again, you bring yourself into your fold. And so you end up disengaging from the vampire, from the parts that actually you might not realize are helping maintain this dynamic. And so, then some, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no. No, no. I'm, I was just thinking that then we, we bring into our consciousness the, the selves that are, are more powerful and independent. Exactly. And doesn't need the vampire's neediness unconsciously. Right. Right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's wild. I love this because a lot of people are in families that are vampires. Yes, they are. And, you know, they they um, they need all of that reinforcement or agreement that we're all going to be stuck together or we're all going to, you know, no one no one should get ahead of anybody else. Right. I think in the East, they call that the tall poppy syndrome. Have you heard about that? No. I think it comes from Australia and, and maybe other parts East, but it's a real saying that they use. Don't be a tall poppy because if you're the tall poppy, you get cut off. So all the poppies are one size. So if one happens to grow tall in the, in the field, and so it's very dangerous. What they're saying collectively is be part of the team. Do not be a leader. One it's very fundamentalist. Yeah. So a lot of fundamental, fundamental groups all want everybody to conform and not not stand out. And you will be attacked if you do stand out. Oh yeah. For example. Yeah, they're very tribal, so they're they're vicious. <laughs> yes. Truly. Truly. Uh, yeah, I know. I work with, with many who are in in. In communities that people tell on each other, tell on, you know, they'll tell about each other <laughs> to yeah. others. Yeah. And it frightens them. And, and there are so many people who don't realize how much of themselves they've given up in order to meld into this community. To be accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that's true for a lot of things in life. What What are we all doing? to make sure we're accepted? That's a beautiful question. And I think listeners could even answer that. And then what parts of themselves, how do that, they define acceptance? So also what I love about voice dialogue is you, you don't get seduced by what an energy looks like. So you could have a rebel self and, you, and that's got all this energy and strength and volume. And you're like, oh, that self doesn't take crap from anybody. And then if you dig deep, maybe that's actually a self that wants acceptance more than a quiet part. Maybe that self is like, no, I'm going to join the punk rock and roll movement and I'm going to just completely take in everything they say. And so if I don't act rebellious, then, then I don't fit in. So that's the other thing I love about this mess method is that you, you don't get seduced by the energy. You find out more and you're like, oh, the rebel is actually more of a conformist than the quiet reader self, for example. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a different point of view. And that's that's great. So so there's so many ways. I mean, coming back to your book and and how much you talk about all of these different selves and different ways that we can examine them yeah. so that we can know ourselves better. And I, I love that. I love the opportunity that that offers us to explore ourselves. I'm so glad it's liberating. I mean, I stumbled upon voice dialogue through synchronicity in the mid nineties. And I, and, and the idea of the identity that you're, that you hold with a certain set of selves, every time you're able to add more, it's transformational. And then you really literally are so much more than you think you are. And that's just gives such life vitality. And then you literally have more strength to go after the goals you want to. It's right. like because you're putting labels on all parts of yourself that you can identify and work with 
succinctly because you they're clear they have a name yeah. yes yeah wow i know <laughs> i know it's, it's it's liberating and i'm sure that um you enjoyed writing this book too <laughs> Yeah, yes. Well, I also, of course, read the book I needed to learn from. I mean, obviously, I was stuck in my own final eighth so often and didn't understand it. So it was in the search of that that this book was formed because I've been there. And then I realized it was a distorted loyalty to different selves that were still in distorted loyalty to early caregivers who believed negative core beliefs. And so again, something about knowing that the motivation was pure made it easier to say, but the behavior is going to stop. And the loyalty is to me, not to some early caregiver. I'm the boss, even of my inner critic. I can't stop my inner critic from having a critical eye, but we need a critical eye if it's not toxic. When I'm writing, I want my editor to say, hey, you know, that could be a bit more succinct. That's a healthy critic who where I'm the boss, that critic is helping me work on a project and make it better that I care about. That inner critic used to work for someone, I don't know, let's just say a name called mom or dad. And, and that inner critic treated me differently when, when my inner critic was working for them. It didn't treat me that well. So I'm just being vulnerable about how powerful it was to say, okay, I want the inner critic's critique ability. But now I have all that power to be excellent and not eviscerating because my inner critic was pretty toxic. And so it was in all of that that the book has unfolded is to try to take the gift and keep the sting away from me. So our audience really has to uh, read your book and appreciate the opportunity to, um, in many ways, decondition themselves from like upgrading like we talked before yeah. and bring them their their inner selves uh up to up to current time <laughs> yeah yeah uh, especially with covid and social uh, uh restlessness and all of that we have more intelligence and more power other than reactivity and that's yeah. i do think that helps society as a whole you're not intimidated because someone doesn't look like you, if you know that we all have different parts and that we can right. figure things out together and all of us have territorial parts and all of us have hopeful parts. And that's all being exposed to us now. So yeah. So the book is called The Final Eighth, Enlist Your Inner Selves to Accomplish Your Goals. Your name is Bridget Dangle Gaspard. How do people follow up? I'm all over the internet and social media. So you can look up the final eighth and you'll find me or Bridget Dangle Gaspard. And every third Thursday of the month, and you are invited to Peter at 8 p.m. Eastern, we have a free voice dialogue learning lab, uh, lab on Zoom. And you can just contact me wow. and, um, and I'll give you the Zoom info, any, any of your listeners. And we have two live short basic sessions so that people are like, well, how does it literally look? For the concrete people, it's a great way to come see how it literally looks and is as you're going through the book. And, and everyone learns just being there because if someone yeah. goes to a particular self, it's a self within you too. This is a great opportunity. Bridget, thanks so much for being a guest at Energy Stew. It's wonderful talking with you. Oh, thanks for having me. It was indeed wonderful. Thank you. And this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H E A R T River.org. I'd love to hear from you and thanks so much for listening. <laughs>